Good morning, good morning, church. Welcome to Evergreen this morning. My name is Jonathan Goolsby. I am our director of youth. On behalf of the rest of the staff, we are glad that you're here joining us in worship this morning. As you make your way in, a couple of announcements for you as we get started. If you are new with us or a guest with us, we have a connection table right outside in the lobby. Please stop by. You can grab uh, some info about our church. Also, if you have any questions, you can speak to myself or Don or Austin or anyone in a green serve shirt. And so they'd be glad to help you. The Boy Scouts, they probably would like to help you as well, but you can just point them towards someone in a green shirt and uh, we can answer any questions you have. Uh, A couple of other things that we have going on. Wednesday night dinner is coming up. It is February 23rd, but you can now RSVP out in the lobby. There is a sign up to come and attend and be a part of the evening. And then there is also a sign up to uh, bring your chili and compete uh, with one another. We are having a chili cook-off that night, and so we would love for everybody to compete. That would be a lot of chili for the night. I'm sure you all won't sign up chilies, but I know you are all planning on attending. February 23rd, please RSVP out in the lobby or online. Also, uh, we'd like you to check your F1 Go inform- information. That's like our church registry. We are updating that. There's also information out there in the lobby for that. If you don't want to do it online, you can uh, go over your information out there and Those are all right. And lastly, if you are a uh, middle schooler, we do not have Sunday school this morning because it is communion Sunday, and so we will just not be having Sunday school on the communion Sundays. That is all the announcements I have for us today. Glad that you're here joining us in worship. As we bring ourselves into the presence of the Lord, let us stand together, if you are able, and remind ourselves of God's glory and goodness. I'll start by saying, all you heavenly beings, acknowledge the Lord's glory and strength. Let everyone in his temple cry, glory. The Lord gives strength to his people, and he blesses his people with peace. Amen. Find me. 
Confessing our sin is not simply remembering all our faults and wrongs. When we confess, we acknowledge the Lordship of Christ and put ourselves in the position to receive God's grace and mercy. Please bow with me as I lead you in this morning's prayer of confession. Holy God, you are the creator, maker, and ruler of all heaven and earth. We praise you for your goodness and your steadfast love towards us. Trusting in who we know you to be, we come before you to confess that we are still a rebellious group of people. Sometimes we intentionally substitute our own will for yours, and at other times we blindly fall in line with our sinful world, following where it leads. Forgive us for all the ways we have rejected you. At the same time, Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit to work to free us from old habits and willful disobedience. Show us your kingdom, and as you do, give us both the power and deep desire to live it out in all we say and do. Hear us now as we come before you and confess our individual sins to you in silence. We approach your throne in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hear this good news. The love of God is beyond measure, and you are included in that love. Let's claim what the word of God has to say about our redemption, using the words on the screen, which are from 1 Peter. I'll begin by saying, It was not with silver or gold that we were redeemed from the empty way of life we once had, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Having been purified by obeying the truth, love one another deeply from your heart. For you have been born again through the living and enduring word of God. Remember, in Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Amen.
seat. And as we invite our children up this morning for our time with younger Christians, will you turn to a neighbor, tell them hello, and then tell them a meal that you deeply love? All right, good morning, all. How are you? Are you staying warm out there? It's quite cold. I got stuck in a snowstorm in Dallas, of all places, this week. But to begin this morning, I was wondering if I could have one or two people help me read something. You don't want to help me read? Well, it's been a great children's time. I'll see you all next week. In that case, I will read. Actually, no, I'm going to get some volunteers from the crowd. So can I have two volunteers to come up here and help me read something? Yeah, there we go. Alrighty. And then, yeah, right. go ahead. Okay, here we go, guys. <laughs> For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Thank you. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all of your strength. Let's give a hand to our wonderful volunteers. Thank you. So in those two passages that we read from the Bible, can you tell me what is the same from those Bible passages? What word did you hear in both ones? Yeah. The Lord, that's true. What else did we hear that was the same? That's right, love. <laughs> we, the Bible tells us time and time again that we are called to love the God, to love God. Why? Because God loves us. And I've been thinking about what love looks like, and I'm going to show a picture on the screen behind me. And this is my grandfather uh, who has taken in my parents' dog for the weekend, Scout. And as you can see on the couch, my grandfather is serenading my parents' dog. He is playing Scout a little song. And to me, this is what love looks like right here. You see, it's clear that my grandpa loves spending time with my parents' dog. Uh, they actually took him for the weekend, uh, not because they had to, but they called my parents up and said, can we, can we watch Scout for the weekend? Uh, and so I was scrolling on Facebook the other day and saw this picture. And what I love about this picture, and what I want us to learn this morning, is that if we are to love something deeply, we have to spend time with that person or thing. And so here, my grandpa is spending time with Scout, really getting to know the dog and getting to know how much the dog loves being with my grandfather. But another way that he is knowing and getting to spend time with the dog is actually by singing and playing a musical instrument to it, which to a dog may seem silly. But when we come together for worship, one of the reasons why we sing songs or hymns is because we are singing a love song back to God. So if we want to spend time loving God, as Deuteronomy says, with all of our heart and with all of our soul and all of our strength, we have to time, spend time with God. And one of the ways also that we get to spend time with God is through reading our Bible and hearing who God is like and how he has first loved us. So let's spend some time talking to God through prayer. God, we are so thankful that you love us. And the fact that you 
want to spend time with us through sending your son, Jesus, because you love the world. And so we ask that you would also make us fall in love with you. Would we want to spend time with you? Would we want to sing songs of love and praise and worship to you? And all of God's people said, amen. All right, you guys are off to Children's Church. Would you thank Austin for doing our children's time this morning? Well, it is good to see everybody this morning. A um, couple of things as we get started. First, you might have um, noticed the scouts out in the lobby this morning. Um, and I wanted to ask, are there any Eagle Scouts in the room? If you are, if there are Eagle Scouts, you stand up. Uh, thank you. We have, um, we have a very active um, scouting program. We have 12 scouts, um, four are working toward Eagle right now. Um, there are 37 Cub Scouts, and so it's one of those things that you don't see that's going on in the life of the church, and I think it's an extremely important thing. And so um, continue to pray for um, our scouts and our leaders and all the people who kind of make that um, go. The other thing that I wanted to, um, to bring to your attention is on March the 5th, everybody say March 5th, March 5th, which is a Saturday, you are invited to be here to hear the author of this book, um, a very important book. Her name is Amy Cameron O'Rourke. She is coming here from Orlando to lead a workshop here at Evergreen. Um, this book called The Fragile Years um, was given to me, and I read it, and then I bought some and gave them to other people as well. Um, this really has to do with with having a plan on the other side of what they refer to in your retirement as the go-go years, right? Because there are the go-go years, the slow-go years, and then the no-go years, right? Um, and as a pastor, I can tell you that a lot of people have a plan for the go-go years. They might even have a plan for the slow-go years. Most people don't have much of a plan for the no-go years. And too often what happens is someone will get sick, they end up in the hospital, the hospital says, well, you can't stay here. And the family says, well, you can't come home. And then everybody sort of looks at each other. That's not a place where we want to be. I don't want you to be there, and I don't want our community to be there. So we're bringing Amy here so that she can walk us through this book. It's, it's extremely important, whether it's for you or whether it's for maybe you're caring for parents somewhere else. It's, this is an extremely important thing. And I asked Amy, I said, so what can I tell people to walk away with? And she said, a plan. That's what you'll walk away with, a plan you'll know what you're going to do. It's a few hours on a Saturday morning, so I would encourage you to bring your friends, your neighbors, your parents, your kids, whoever it is, but, but, as, but as you see the sign up, go ahead and take advantage of it because it is going to be a very good and practical thing for us to do. Well, I think as you heard Austin say, we were in Dallas this week for the Eco Conference. Um, it, was a, it was a great time. Um, was a little bit overshadowed by the fact that it was going to snow on Thursday. And so because everyone's Southerners, everyone's freaking out about, you know, some snow and ice and our flight got canceled and all of that. But the reason I'm wearing my, my bow tie this morning is you can't see this from where you are, um, but it is an eco bow tie. And this will let you know that my wife cannot resist anything that's on a conference table. I mean, <laughs> you know, and so I had to wear it. Um, but I also wanted to, um, I was in a breakout, um, and there was a woman, her name is Danielle Strickland. I was not familiar with her, but apparently the rest of the world is. I'm not, but... But she did something um, in that breakout that I want to do with you because I found it to be so unbelievably powerful. So whether you're at home or you're here, um, you're probably not going to do this if you're at home um, exactly the way I'm suggesting. But if you can stand um, with me, if you can't, that's okay. But 
And what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to do a couple of things with your hands, and then I'm going to ask you to repeat after me. So we're going to start by making fists, and we're going to hold them up here like this. And I just want you to repeat after me. I confess, I confess. my natural human posture is to fight for myself, to make something happen, to get my way. But I choose, as a follower of Jesus, to open up my hands and my life in a posture of surrender. I give up, and I give in to the love of Jesus. I give over my life and surrender my life with all its concerns and gifts to the one who created me. Now I want you to make fists and hold them about here and repeat after me. I confess my natural human posture is to take, to keep, and to hold. But I choose, as a follower of Jesus, to open my hands and my life in a posture of generosity. Freely I have received, and freely I give. Now fold your arms and sort of put them here. Repeat, I confess, my natural human posture is to critique to spectate, to stand at a distance, to say it's not my problem. But I choose, as a follower of Jesus, to open my hands and my life in a posture of mission. And I choose to see others the way God sees them. I open my life to the despair of the world so that I might bring the hope that is in Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. When Danielle did that, actually Austin was sitting in that breakout with me, and I leaned over to him and I said, can you imagine what would happen if you did that every Sunday for a year? It would change the way we think, it would change the way we act, and it would open us to the movement of the Holy Spirit. We're starting a new series today called Sent, and it is just a short series on being sent in the name of Jesus into the world with the good news of the gospel, which is that the kingdom of heaven, the perfect peace of God, is available to everyone who believes that Jesus, through the cross, has forgiven our sins and opened a way for us to be in this kingdom now. And as we start, I want to remind you of the vision statement which the leaders of the church adopted last year. And here it is. It should be on the screen. And I want you to, because you've already been repeating after me, so you can repeat after me a little bit more. I want to just read through this with you. So the purpose of Evergreen is to inspire, teach, and disciple ordinary people to become missionaries of Christ in their local communities so that our neighborhoods reflect the kingdom of heaven. And in this series, we just want to talk a little bit about what it means to be a missionary of Christ, because it's likely that being a missionary is the one thing in this statement that you will both agree with and at the same time feel a little threatened by. And every church that I've ever been in has had some sort of banner or vision statement or something which emphasized that followers of Jesus are supposed to be moving the message of the kingdom forward and out into the world. We all know what we are supposed to do. And I think some of us try. But we don't find that what we do is very effective. And so we sort of give up. And so this morning I want to share a word from the Lord with you based on Jesus' first encounters with his disciples after he is resurrected. It's in John chapter 20, but before we do that, I want to pray with you. 
God, we encounter you in, in so many ways. You were always here with us. And so I pray for those who are hearing my voice, whether they are online or in this room. I pray this for myself. That we would encounter your spirit in a new and fresh way this morning. That you would blow both fresh wind and a fresh fire into us. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Now, to set the stage here for the text this morning, Jesus has been crucified on Friday. It is now Sunday, Sunday evening to be exact. Mary has already seen Jesus in the garden. She's told the disciples this, which I am pretty sure there were mixed reviews on. It does not say this in the Bible, but think about it. It's been an emotional few days completely disorienting. Everything that the disciples thought, everything that they'd anticipated, everything that they hoped for, came to a brutal end at the cross. (laughs) If we're online and you don't know what somebody's phone was ringing and that's what that was all about. They are traumatized. The disciples are exhausted. They're grief-stricken. And they're under threat. Mary, having hallucinations in a cemetery early in the morning, I mean, we don't think about this, right? But the disciples, well, you know, they might think, poor Mary. It's kind of understandable after everything she's gone through. And so here they are, beaten to death, just about, not physically, but but spiritually and emotionally. And people are apparently losing their minds. They're afraid of what's coming next, and they really don't know what to do next. And then Jesus appears among them. If you're looking in John chapter 20, what you will notice is that Jesus' first words to them are this. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. It says, on the evening of the first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you be with you. Now, most of the time when you read this, you think
kingdom based on the confidence of God's goodness as Adam and Eve saw it before sin entered the world grasp this this perfection this peace this hope and then Jesus says as the father is sending as the father has sent me so i am sending you Now, most of the time, I think that when we hear Jesus say that, what we hear is this. I am sending you to do the work that I did. I am sending you to do the work that I did the way I did it, through sacrifice and giving yourself away. And that's not wrong. But I don't quite think that's what Jesus is saying here. I think that what he is saying here is, I am sending you the way I was sent. I was sent with a vision of who God is. I know the Father more than anyone else, and so I am sending you with the same vision, a vision of shalom, of wholeness, of the defeat of death, and the redemption of brutality and violence. I'm sending you with peace, with shalom. Shalom is your tool. That is your focus. That is the content of what you are going with. And then the text says, and he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. As I was sitting in the airport looking at this text, I thought to myself, I don't want anyone in this place to breathe on me. (laughs) Ever. Jesus breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit, which to me is sort of the seal, the cap, the living presence that will be in them to remind them and guide them and lead them in the shalom, in the peace that Jesus has given them and opened up for the rest of the world. You see, Jesus is sending his disciples to be missionaries, his messengers, into whatever local community they might find themselves. And they eventually find themselves all over the known world. And that is where he is sending them. And they will tell the story of Jesus and what he did and how it brings about the kingdom of heaven both now and into the future. But more important than where they are going or even what they will say or what they will do when they get there, is what he gives them to take with them. He gives them shalom, sealed into them, almost seared into them by the Holy Spirit. And this is what we either forget or miss or don't know how to access. And it's that which stunts our effectiveness. We are very good at planning. We are very good at implementation. We are very good at collecting data and strategizing and structuring. And this is why we can be very busy, but never make much headway for the kingdom of heaven. We'll end up very nice people, even helpful people, But the death does not make us people who are filled with the Holy Spirit. And so I don't want to repeat mistakes that I have made in the past, which is sending people out without first doing what Jesus did with those that he sent out, anchoring them both in shalom and in the Holy Spirit. And the best way that I know to do this is to begin to teach you how to access both things. And the best way I know to do that is through prayer but a kind of prayer that you might not be used to doing. And so I'm going to teach you this morning something called a breathing prayer. It's a very ancient way of praying. Um, You might know that the Greek word for spirit is pneuma, which is also the word for breath. And you may or may not be wired for this kind of thing, and I understand that, right? You might be like, oh gosh, what is he going to make me do? I understand I understand, but I used to be you until I encountered the Holy Spirit 
and something like this, something very similar. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is suspend all your objections and try this. Remember, God brought Adam to life by breathing into him. Jesus breathed his Holy Spirit on his disciples, and they inhaled it. So those aren't just words. They are clues. Anyway, most of us don't breathe very well. Some of us, uh, so for some of us, this is going to be something rather new. And the first few times that you do this, you might be a little uncomfortable. It could even make you a little bit dizzy. So watch out for that. I don't want anybody to, like, fall out because, you know, they're breathing weird. And what I want you to do is I want you to learn to breathe from down here, right? Now, John's already with me because this is what singers do, right? But most of us, we breathe very shallowly and we breathe way up here in our chests. But we have to learn to breathe more fully. So what I want you to do, if you're at home, you can do this. If you're here, you can do this. And I'm actually going to get this a little bit out of the way. And I'm going to get a chair. I want you to get your feet squarely on the floor. Get yourself anchored to the ground that God created. And what we're going to do is we are going to do something called the Beloved Prayer. And we're going to do this seven times. I know it sounds like a lot. Be loved. Be loved. Be loved. Be loved. Be. loved. Okay, you can open your eyes. I may have done a bonus in there. I don't know. I lost count somewhere along the way. And you might have felt your shoulders coming down a little bit. You might have felt some tension in your hands letting go. You might have just might have felt a spark of God's love 
in you. I think this is extremely important to understand. And I'll, I'll share with you, one of my great fears of doing something like this with you is that it, create, it can create an excuse for people not to go across the street, right? Oh, well, I've got to do all this, so I'm not going to go across the street, right? I mean, I've got to do this first. And I, I don't want this to be an excuse. I want it to be a place where you're plowing ground where you are receiving what the disciples received when Jesus said, receive the Holy Spirit. This is extremely important to begin to unlock the fear in your own life. Remember, the disciples are in the room with locked doors because they are afraid. Most of us don't do things because we are afraid. And you've got to begin to unlock that. And what unlocks it? the presence of Christ. And so that's what this is all about. Even if it seems silly to you, I'll tell you that this will begin to make a difference for you. Now, we're going to do this again, but I want to change it a little bit. Same words, different focus. Still again, I want you to be, I want you to be in the presence of God. But when you start thinking about love, I want you to start thinking about people who are around you. It could be people who are literally around you here this morning. It could be people in your family. It could be neighbors across the street, right? Because now you are using the Holy Spirit to begin to truly plow ground between you and whoever God is actually calling you to. I don't know who God is calling you to. God knows he's, who he's calling you to. And so just close your eyes again. We're going to take a couple of breaths to get started. In and out. In and out. Be loved. 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 and open your eyes. It's a simple exercise, but I think it becomes very important for us as we begin to prepare ourselves for the mission that God is calling us to, which might be right next door. It might be someone in your own household, someone in your own family, someone you work with. But I believe that God is always trying to speak. God is always trying to lead us. And God does not send us out on the mission field alone, without him, without a vision of what is to come. Yet we have to claim that in our own lives before we can give it to a single other person. Which is why sometimes I think it's so ineffective. Because we go out and we go out under our own strength and, you know, we only get so far with that. And so the choir is going to uh, lead us in an anthem called Remember, Remember Me, um, which is um, really based around the words of institution. We're going to go into communion here in just a moment. Um, and as they sing, I want you to also remember that when we say remember, right, especially when it comes to communion, what we're really doing is, is pulling a past act, right, the sacrifice of Christ, into the present so that we can claim it as our own.
And because I have a case of the sniffles, and therefore I do not want to touch anything up here. But I will do the words of institution, and then Austin is going to carry them out. On the night that Jesus was gathered in an upper room with his disciples, a few days before the text that we talked about this morning, he took a loaf of bread, and he broke it, And he said to those who were gathered, this is my body. It's given for you. Take, eat, all of you. And when you do so, remember me. In a like manner, the Lord took the cup and he poured it. And he said, this cup represents the new covenant, the new agreement between God and humanity for the forgiveness of sins. Every time we eat the bread, and every time we drink the cup, we proclaim and show forth the saving death of our risen Lord, until the day he returns. These are God's gifts, and they are for us, God's people. I'm going to invite the servers to come forward, and as they are coming forward, um, you may be new with us this morning, so let me just tell you how we take communion here. Uh, First, let me say you are invited. If you're a follower of Christ, we invite you to the table. This is not an evergreen table. It's the table of the Lord. And um, what we do is we, you come up, and um, someone will tear off a piece of bread and hand it to you. You dip it in the cup. You can partake of that right there, um, and then make your way back to your seat. If you need gluten-free elements, they are here. If you will just ask one of the servers, they would be um, more than happy to help you with that as well. Um, if, you can't, if you can't come forward, um, that's fine. We will be happy to bring it to you. Um, or um, you can use the um, self-serve communion elements in the back as well. So let us share this feast together.
Stand together now as we sing our Lord's Prayer. be seated. Every worship service we have an opportunity to give, and today is no different. And we give because we have freely received. We cannot outgive a God who has given all for us. And so as we dedicate our giving this morning, would you pray with me? God, thank you for giving us the ability to return something, anything to you, whether that is our time, our our physical gifts, our resources. And we ask, Lord, that you would take those things and that through them you would help us to inspire and teach and disciple people to be ordinary people, to be missionaries of Christ, wherever you call them, so that our neighborhoods reflect the kingdom of heaven. Thank you, Lord, that you have entrusted this to us and that you believe in us even more than we believe in ourselves. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. And I can't remember whether we have a faith statement of faith. Do we have a statement of faith? We don't have a statement of faith. So we're going to go right into the hymn.
As you prepare to leave this place, I want you to close your eyes for a moment and consider what it is that is keeping you locked up. What is the fear that you have inside you? And now allow the presence of God to bring his shalom, his peace, his wholeness, his healing into that most fearful place in your life to unlock you, to free you, and not just for your own purpose and good, but that so you may be his ambassador and missionary wherever he calls you. My friends, receive the Holy Spirit and go from this place. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. You may be seated for the postlude.